Welcome to Beyond Six Seconds, the podcast that goes beyond the six second first impression to share the extraordinary stories and achievements of everyday people. I'm your host, Carolyn Keel. Today, we're going to do something a little different on the show where my guest is actually going to interview me. The topic of today's podcast is how to get unstuck and move your plot forward. So I'm going to share some stories about times that I've felt stuck And I will talk about what I did in those situations to get unstuck. And then both of us are going to share our tips and advice based on our own experiences about how to get unstuck when we are in a situation that we want to move forward from. So if you're someone who's feeling stuck right now, either life, career, anything like that, you definitely want to listen to this episode because we share some really great tips and advice all throughout the episode. So I'm happy that you're here. And now I'm going to introduce Valerie. So my guest today is Valerie Gordon. She's the owner of the career and communication strategy firm Commander in She. In her 20 years of television, Valerie produced stories for HBO, CBS, ESPN, Weekend Today, and Lifetime. But she's most fascinated by the stories we tell ourselves and others and the influence and impact of those stories on our career success and satisfaction. With Commander in She, Valerie combines her storytelling background with her passion for helping women define success on their own terms. And she's here today to talk about stories for success, how to get unstuck and move your plot forward, because she believes that within each of us is an even better next chapter. Valerie, thanks so much for being on my podcast today. Thank you, Carolyn, for having me. I'm excited to be with you. One of the many things we have in common is our love for stories and storytelling and You know, certainly since I've started this podcast, I started it around a focus about hearing people's stories. And I just really enjoy learning so much about people, understanding what they've overcome to achieve wonderful things and really make a difference in the world and just sort of uncover those uh, those stories, those hidden gems that you wouldn't normally think of with some people who just haven't shared them yet. And it's uh, it's a little bit like uncovering a hidden treasure for me and I enjoy it. So I'd love to hear about you know, your passion for storytelling as well. Well, I love storytelling and I love the people who take the time to tell stories. And that's why I was drawn to your podcast and in particular, the title of your show, Beyond Six Seconds, mm-hmm. to really understand what you're going for is, um, as you explained it to me, that the average person looks at a resume or makes a decision about a person in just six seconds. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's not enough time to know anything about a person's story. You're only going to know very surface level things that you see immediately. And so I love the idea that you're taking the time to highlight and profile people who have really interesting stories to tell and you need more than six seconds to invest to learn about them. And that's how we initially connected is I just, I followed your great content and I love um, anyone who tells stories. I, for many years, put stories on television. And during the course of my career was telling stories to myself, obviously about why I was or wasn't successful and was a real advocate for other women in the workforce and realized that we were all telling ourselves stories. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these stories were helpful and sometimes they weren't. And the stories we tell other people obviously impact the opportunities that we'll get. And the stories we tell ourselves influence our course of action And that's what led me after a very um, long and successful television career to leave that business and decide to focus my storytelling efforts, not on putting stories on the air, but in helping um, my clients, mostly women, to think about their careers like a series of chapters in a story Mm -hmm. and to take greater command of that story. So that means everything from encapsulating your backstory, how you network, how you speak of yourself, your personal brand, how you prepare for an interview to dealing with the current plot twists in your story, the conflict and dissatisfaction and things that might not be going the way you think your story should. Mm-hmm. And we're going to talk about that today, the whole idea of feeling stuck or you know, getting unstuck in, in your story. Right. And also the goal setting necessary to create a better next chapter. So that's where I am right now with my business is using the principles of storytelling to help people with the tools and skills they need, the communication skills and the career-minded tools to find greater success and satisfaction at work. But when it comes down to it, I'm just fascinated by the stories people tell. So I love your podcast and I love the fact that you are telling stories I would never otherwise have a chance to hear Mm. and meet people through the stories you're telling. 
But I'm also naturally curious about the storyteller. (laughs) And when you and I connected offline, I asked a little bit about your career journey. And you have a very interesting story to tell as well that I don't believe you've yet shared on Beyond Six Seconds because you're always playing the role of interviewer. So I'm glad that you've agreed to work with me and kind of switch a little bit here and allow you... You've shared so many terrific stories, but I'm hoping today that you'll share a little bit of your own so that listeners can see you as more than just someone who shares other people's stories, but also has a really interesting one to tell herself. And I think we can tie it into this theme of getting unstuck because that's something that both you and I have felt in our careers. So if I may, let me let me start by asking you the first question, sure. a little bit about your career history and what you thought you wanted to do and where that took you? Where did you wind up? So gosh, let's see. For my career history, you know, when I when I first started out and was going to school, I always had a passion and an interest in helping people uncover their talents or achieve goals, whether those were personal goals, career goals. And so I remember thinking very early on, particularly when I was in high school, I looked at my uh, guidance counselors who were actually quite helpful for me and said, oh, I'd love to be like, you know, a guidance counselor or someone that could help coach people and guide people, not necessarily in a clinical way, but certainly to achieve their own goals. Then went to college and studied psychology because I was interested in human behavior. And that was the uh, closest major that would bring me to that field and started exploring different areas of psychology and worked in our career development office over at the school and thought, oh, this is kind of like guidance counseling. I really like this career counseling because it's tools and talents and learning. And on my senior year, I was an intern in our career development office, which was probably one of my favorite jobs that I've ever had. <laughs> that was just seven hours a week, but I got to do a variety of different things around coaching and building programs and you know running workshops and just feeling like I had an impact and was able to share resources to help my fellow students. And I remember uh, right before I was graduating college, I was talking with probably some of my advisors or some other mentors in the field saying, you know, I'd really love to be a career counselor. And they said, well, Carolyn, you haven't like really worked a real job. Like, I don't think you can be a career counselor. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I guess I'll go figure out something else to do. So wouldn't say that's really maybe my first time of getting stuck, but that was sort of set me on the path to, you know, after a couple of jobs trying things out after college, I landed at a very uh, major financial uh, services company, uh, MasterCard, where I started as an admin and worked my way up the ladder because that's what I, you know, felt like I should be doing at a large corporation. And people said, oh, you know, you're really great. You're good at what you do. I got promoted a couple times. I moved into different roles and got to build programs that help people manage change and build uh, new systems. And I worked in a whole variety of things, including risk management and data governance and new product development. So I was doing a bunch of different things and being very busy. But towards the end of my tenure there, I was kind of reflecting and realizing that the current position that I was in there was not the right fit for me. And then that's where I really started to feel stuck and not really know what to do from there. So, you know, I I tried a couple different techniques where I was reflecting and thinking about what I like to do in my previous roles and positions, identifying the types of activities and experiences that I had really enjoyed in the past, and thinking about what I was good at. So for me, I was quickly able to identify that I liked doing internal employee communication. So I had written a lot of presentations. I was a speech writer and a presentation crafter for our um, chief risk officer when he would go on the road and present to major industry associations. I wrote internal presentations and memos to the CEO about research. And I enjoyed training, which was the other piece. And those figure in a lot. Anytime you're working on a major program that initiates a change at the company, there's always a communications and training piece. So that's kind of how I identified what I wanted in general. And um, still wasn't quite easy. That was just one of the first steps. And I still felt stuck there for uh, for quite a while. And it took me uh, several other things to get myself unstuck from that particular position. 
And I know we're going to talk about some of the tips to get yourself unstuck. But what I'm most taken with by your story is, first of all, how easily you recall what you called, you know, perhaps what might have been your favorite job mm-hmm. ever, your, your seven hours a week at this <laughs> career counseling office when you were in college. And it's funny how some of those early experiences can shape us. And then yet we come out of school or we start our first job and we get on this path. And as you said, you know, you, you were very busy being busy mm-hmm. and that's what happens. And we get so intent on, okay, first I'm going to do this. Then I get the next promotion and the next promotion. And for a lot of people, then they wake up one day and they say, well, wait a minute, this isn't exactly where I thought I was going to be. Yeah. It's almost like you're following the steps and you're so busy that you, you don't take the time to think about, do I actually want to go where I'm headed? And oftentimes that can change over time, right? Like you, you had to take the time to determine, well, what is it I really liked in these past few jobs while I was so busy? And I think that's the mistake many people make. And the reason they get themselves stuck is they don't take the opportunity to consider whether I recommend every 12 to 18 months, what do I like? What have I learned in this past time? What do I still need to learn? Who do I enjoy working with? Who are the leaders of the company both today and perhaps tomorrow that I need to make myself visible to? And so that time that you took to identify what you enjoyed about those jobs you had, the training and communications aspect, how surprised were you when you determined that? And then how did you use that information to craft your next chapter? It wasn't that much of a surprise for me. You know, it took a little while to formulate. And I think a lot of people fall into this trap where they get so busy or they spend so much time in a role that's not a good fit for them and it consumes their life. And then literally Mm -hmm. they forget one, what they're good at. And sometimes they even forget what they like to do. And it just gets pushed to the back so much. But fortunately, I did have some opportunities in that role that wasn't a good fit for me to do a little training and a little communication. So I was able to remember that, okay, I really like that. And I'd like to pivot towards another role, my next role that would focus much more exclusively on one or both of those things, training and communications. And it's funny, a lot of the traditional advice that I had read or had been given as I was working at MasterCard for 13 years was, you want to find a really great company to work with and rise through the ranks. And because you're an internal candidate all the time, you know, you'll have an advantage over everybody else coming in. And then you'll be able to grow and be able to switch into new things much more easily. And then I really don't know if things, you know, maybe things changed while I was working there over the years, or maybe that was never the case. But I found that while I was trying to transfer internally or find a new role, and I was interviewing And I was networking, like doing informational interviews just to learn about different roles, different areas of the company. I found it was actually quite difficult. And there was absolutely no guarantee or favoritism for internal candidates in the particular roles that I was looking at. So that that was a big shock to me because that was absolutely not what I was expecting. So I I feel like that advice to people, if, if people are hearing that or people are feeling frustrated, maybe they're trying to get into an external company or they're at a role in their company and they're afraid to leave, you know, just to keep in mind as part of your overall career development and, and reflection that just because you're already at a company doesn't mean that you have to stay there or that you're a shoe in for, for future roles. It's not necessarily easier. I mean, that's one thing that I learned. I agree. I agree. I actually think it can be quite challenging because you can become pigeonholed where yeah. people see you in a certain way and they have a hard time accepting that you might want to move in a di- your career in a different direction. Sometimes you need to leave to do that or at least take small incremental steps to reinvent yourself. Now, I don't know if this would come as a surprise to your listeners that this is not your full-time job doing this podcast. This is a a passion project and I'm sure a labor of love for you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and then we can go back and, and revisit all those ways that you get yourself unstuck to create an even better next chapter. Absolutely. So my um, full-time day job is I work at Verizon Wireless at the corporate headquarters doing employee training for one of the business units in the digital area. So it's a lot of uh, training needs assessment and planning and you know, communications piece as well. So the, the spoiler, I guess, for the story is I did make that transition into training, which I was very happy about. And certainly the, uh, the story continues because I have many more working years ahead of me. <laughs> so that's my day job, which I really enjoy being able to make that difference in employees' lives and their goals that they're able to achieve within their business. 
But with the podcast, I started that kind of as a creative project for myself. Again, I was interested in being able to learn about people. I really wanted something that I could practice my own interviewing skills, my own storytelling skills, where I could be on the mic and create and launch episodes out to the world and just sort of, you know, see what the interest is. And, you know, I started in January of this year and I've been really heartened and sometimes occasionally a little dumbfounded with the great response that I've been getting with my podcast because I've just met so many wonderful people. Everyone I've interviewed has really had a good time on the show, which is also important for me as well. I really do like to help showcase people and give them a platform to tell stories that they may or may not normally have a chance to tell other people. So um, that's uh, one of the reasons that I put together the podcast. And it serves, it's such a, a valuable service because I think people not only like hearing other people's stories, they like to see themselves in those stories. You know, what's the lesson for me here? And I think there's certainly lessons in your own career journey that would be helpful to your listeners or anyone struggling with finding them themselves maybe not precisely where they'd like to be. So let me ask you one more question about that. And then I know we want to talk about this whole idea of getting unstuck. Sure. Um, But you mentioned that you are doing now for Verizon what you had hoped to do. You're working in in training. How did you make that transition? How did it come about? Mm. I was in my role sort of feeling stuck, knowing what I wanted to do, that I like training, I like communications, but hitting a lot of walls internally with doing a lot of traditional networking and activities and things like that, which I have to say are still important to do. You should still be out talking and meeting with people who are working in the roles that you are really interested in, or even people who typically would hire people in that role that you're interested in, you know, whether or not they're actually hiring at that moment. It's important. But, um, you know, I had had a lot of conversations. I really didn't feel like I was making traction. So for me, uh, there were two sort of big things that I did. One was that I decided to go back to school to get my master's degree in organizational behavior, not specifically because I thought that, oh, once I have this degree, then I'll land this training job that I really, really want. It was more around, I just wanted to improve my own learning and you know, knowledge about the field of industrial organizational psychology. So psychology for business. So it's like talent management and development and organizational effectiveness and training and communication. So all of my interests really tied into that. So I started going back to school part-time for my master's. And two, I started working with an outside coach, which I definitely would recommend to people. I know anytime I need to make a big major change, I often need someone to help me through it. One, even if it's just to keep me accountable, but two, it's really helpful to have someone to guide you through what you need to do and just help you reflect because sometimes it's hard to do that all by yourself or it's hard to do it with family because a lot of times they're not impartial. They may be invested in having you go one way or the other way. So the objectivity of a coach really helps. And around the times that I started doing both those things, going to school and starting with my coach, my role changed even more significantly, where basically I was given the choice to continue on with the role, but they basically took, you know, all the the training and the communications pieces out. They wanted me to be a pure play around like business analysis, which, you know, they they wanted me to stay for, but I knew for sure that that was not, I kind of saw the path that that would lead me down when they were presenting it Mm -hmm. with me. I'm like, oh, I know this is not the way I want to go. Or they said, you know, you know, you can move on from the company. And they gave me some help with that as well. So I actually took the choice to move on. At this point, I had spent years building up my network and I was well practiced with job searching. And it was kind of an interesting bit of serendipity that as I was filling out my notice period in my last role, I started getting a, um, an interview request for a contract role, which was something I had never done before at uh, BMW, which is about like 10 or 15 minutes away from where I live. Very, very close. And, um, you know, at first I kind of ignored it because I didn't think it was real. It's like, oh, come on, this isn't like a real thing. But then they kept contacting me. So shortly after that, a few months after I went for that, it was a pure employee training role, which was exactly what I wanted to do. And I was able to pivot into this contract role that was, you know, at a great company, not I have to say, at the same level as where I had left at my previous role. So it was a bit of a step, I hate to say step down in title, but I got to work with amazing people and really build my competence specifically in training. And then from there, I was able to leverage that experience and move to 
a company called ITT that does manufacturing and automation and do not just training, but also organizational culture change, which is fascinating. And I just uh, kind of continued from there. And now I'm at Verizon doing training. So I think that that experience, that major time where I got stuck and then was given a bit of an ultimatum actually worked out really well for me. But I think it was because I had put together all of that preparation beforehand. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it didn't just happen. I think that's what, you know, why so many people get stuck is that they don't actually think through the steps and the changes they're going to need to make to get unstuck. And for you, obviously, it was like a, a multiple plot points coming together. There was the advanced degree. There was working with the coach. Mm -hmm. There was the decision to leave something where you certainly could have, you know, could have stayed and kept going. And as you say, take sort of a step down in that contract position, knowing that you could leverage that down the road. And if you hadn't done any one of those things, we don't know if you would have gotten to where you are today. So there definitely has to be some, you know, throwing of a caution to the wind in order to be able to, to get to that next chapter. What I find most people the reason they get stuck is that they either A, don't know what they want, mm-hmm. or B, they know what they want, but they don't think they're going to get it. So what's the point of even trying? Yes. And I think what you and I both have through our experience of having left a career, I left television to form my own company, and you've certainly um, had your own interesting career journey as well. I think we've learned things about how to use that sense of, I'm not quite in the right place. I don't want to get stuck or I'm feeling stuck, something's not quite working for me. And then we've drawn upon our experience to be able to come up with tips for other people on what to do um, to get yourself unstuck. And I know your first tip mirrors one of mine in a slightly different way. You had mentioned about taking the time to identify what it is you like to do. Yeah. Do you want to talk us through maybe how you did that? And then I'll give my corresponding tip to your listeners. Sure. So there were a couple of techniques I used. One is that you can look through your past documentation. So look through your resume, your previous roles, or if you've hopefully you've printed out and saved all your performance evaluations, uh, you know, which I highly recommend you do, because usually you have to, in a detailed way, document everything that you did each year. And then you have feedback from your manager or, um, or their boss, which is really helpful because uh, your memory tends to fade on the details over time. So looking through that and then you can kind of pick out like, oh, yeah, I forgot. I really enjoyed that project or I really liked that type of work that I did three years ago, and then just making notes of that and and putting things together. Another thing that I did both in my graduate program and with my coach, there are some tools that will help you think through and learn more about what your strengths are and what you like to do. So, I mean, Strengths Finder by Gallup is another really popular one, which is good. Um, that's more general. It will kind of tell you in more around what your strengths and what you really value in, in a role. It's not as directive as to saying you should be working in training or doing this, but it helps you understand what is important for you. And then another tool that I used, which is not as well known, is called Seven Stories. And I did that as part of my grad school study, which is literally, it has you writing down, I think you actually start with 20 stories where you think through your whole life and you write down stories where you did something that you enjoyed, that you felt like you were good at, and that you felt like you accomplished something, even if it's like you accomplished something positive or you felt really good about what you did. And it forces you to write, forces you at first to write 20 so that you don't select out your stories. So you're kind of just doing a brain dump. Then it has you narrow them down to seven stories and build those out to really understand, okay, what actions did you take? Who else was involved? What was the result and why was it powerful for you? And that I learned a lot from that particular exercise because a lot of the things I was writing down, you know, some of them were pretty obvious to me that, of course, they were great experiences. Like, you know, as, as a hobby from time to time, I've also been a singer and a musician. So I've sung in some amazing venues. So, you know, I wrote a lot of those down. And it's like, oh, of course, I thought that that was a pivotal experience and that was wonderful and exhilarating because that was kind of a hobby of mine. But as you get to like story number 10 and beyond, you have to start really thinking back. And I remember writing down things like working as an editor in chief of my high school yearbook and selling like a thousand dollars worth of display ads where I was going door to door to local businesses and asking for donations, which I felt really satisfying and good about, which is interesting because today I do not think of myself as a salesperson or someone who would be comfortable like walking around asking people for donations. But apparently when I was 17, I was perfectly comfortable and satisfied with that. So like, "Hmm, maybe there's something there. 
maybe there's some piece of that and just understanding what it is about that. So that's a, another way is to use tools like that to, to understand yourself more. I find it really interesting that you were a singer and here you are behind the microphone. Now you're mm-hmm. not singing, but there's something about that position that must be appealing to you. And I think you're absolutely right about finding your strengths. And there's any number of ways that you can do that. And my corresponding tip here um, for your listeners is going to be similar, but um, a little more specific. I think in our stories, we always try to avoid this because we feel like, because if we don't like it, it makes us uncomfortable. But you have to learn how to use conflict and dissatisfaction to your advantage. Mm-hmm. So if you're feeling stuck, if you're feeling like you're in a role that isn't right for you, or you really dislike your boss or your colleagues or the beige walls of your cubicle, whatever it is, rather than letting that get you down or feel like, there's no way out. You use that state of being as an opportunity to look at, well, what's not working for you? You almost have to embrace it in order to find what will work for you. So if conflict and dissatisfaction show up in your life, what I say is these are cornerstones of a really good story. You've never actually seen a movie or watched a TV show or read a book where there's no conflict. Mm -hmm. I mean, conflict is what makes a story great. So why do we assume that conflict shouldn't show up in our stories, that we should get up every day and everything's hunky-dory and it's all great and going according to plan? Well, that would be a boring life. Mm -hmm. Plus, which it's just not realistic. It doesn't happen. So if you're feeling stuck or you're feeling like you're in a situation that really isn't working for you, just like you suggest taking the time to really think through, well, when am I happiest? Also think through, well, why is this not working for me? And then you can start to create a scenario in which you get more of what you want and less of what you don't. You first have to identify what the conflict is and what's causing the dissatisfaction. And then, of course, you need to make the choice, sometimes difficult choice, to move beyond that because studies have shown that most people would rather stay in a miserable situation Mm -hmm. where they know the outcome than take the chance at improving the situation but not knowing what's going to happen next. So... I think our advice there on that first point is is aligned of both knowing your strength and what you enjoy and knowing why you're feeling like you're in this state of conflict or you're dissatisfied so that you can move on from it. And one of the ways I know we move on from it is you have to think about, well, who's in your network? Mm -hmm. And I have a tip here. I know you do as well about expanding your network. How do you do that? How do you recommend someone do that? I just started out by being curious. I think that's really core to remember as you're networking. So, you know, you, you don't want to wait to network when you desperately need something. Like when you, when, if you desperately need a job right now, I mean, you, you know, obviously you can still have needs and desires and things that you want to get out of a networking relationship, but you know, you're in a stronger position if you're coming in willing to give and share or at a minimum, just be curious about people. Cause, you know, as we were talking about earlier and I've certainly learned since working on the podcast, is that people really do like talking about themselves. So Mm -hmm. as you're networking, whether you start internally with groups that you're curious to learn more about, either what somebody does at your company in a different department, or what does this other team do that you've heard good things about and you just want to learn more about it, approach it with curiosity and just schedule, you know, short conversations. If you can do it in person, that's great. Maybe um, over coffee or phone calls. Like, and I would recommend, I always used to lead with like 20 minute phone calls just to set that expectation that it's not going to be a very long commitment on someone's time, particularly if, if it's the first time that you're meeting. And, um, you know, just be curious to learn more about how they got to where they are or, you know, what it's like to work in the field of employee training or what it's like to work in PR. Because if you're curious, you really will learn good information that will help guide which way you want to go in your career. Because you may think that you love one area and then you talk to people who work there and they tell you exactly what it's like to work in that field. And they're like, oh, okay, I didn't know it was like that. I don't like this particular part of the field, but maybe I can pivot to something else. And then people can help you work through your thinking and give ideas. And actually, one other networking tip is that, you know, since I started the podcast, I've just had such an easier time talking with people. Because I, you know, I tend to be shy. I don't like to be the person who comes up and says, hey, I'd like to give you my sales pitch or whatever it is I'm trying to do. But just again, it goes back to being able to lead with something that you can give. So I'm offering an opportunity for people to talk about themselves. And 
you know, not everybody's interested in that, but plenty of people are. And it just really opens up the conversation because I have that curiosity about what their experience was like. And um, I've built a lot of really strong relationships since starting the podcast that I probably wouldn't have done. So um, I guess my other advice is start a podcast. (laughs) In some (laughs) cases, that actually has the bandwidth for. But but I know that you're a big fan of the informational interviews. And I also know that you're a fan. We, you and I connected originally on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. So yes. for anyone who uses that as a as a professional platform, it is a terrific networking platform once you see how you can share valuable content and then get to know the people, the providers behind that content. And in fact, I would count you in my cast of supporting characters, which is what I would call that's my parallel to your expand your network concept to get unstuck. Mine would be um, reevaluate your cast of supporting characters. Mm-hmm. So that obviously relates to your network. Who do you know and who's in your line of vision that might be able to open new doors for you? So you obviously are the central character of your own story, but you have all these people you interact with and that might change over time. But I believe there are four types of people that you should have in your cast of supporting characters because they each give you something uh, different and something necessary. And so the four types that I would say should be in your cast of supporting characters or your network would be your cheerleader. Mm -hmm. Your cheerleader is someone who thinks you're great. Your Mm -hmm. cheerleader will pick you up when you are down, when you are really hard on yourself or when something bad has happened to you. And who doesn't need a cheerleader in their life? So whether it's a supportive colleague or your best friend or your mom, who's your biggest cheerleader, it's really important to have that person in your network. The second person I recommend is your collaborator. Who brings out the best in you? You know, is it someone at work who helps you think creatively, who helps you think strategically? Who do you collaborate with that brings out all of your best ideas? Ideally, you want to work on a daily basis with with people who can do that. But even if that person isn't in your immediate line of vision at work, if you have someone like that in your life who always keeps you thinking one step ahead Mm -hmm. and creating and ideating, whatever we want to call it, your collaborator does that for you. I'm a big fan of having an accountability partner. Mm -hmm. So that would be my third character, whether you want to call it a realist or an accountability partner. This person keeps your feet on the ground. Your cheerleader always says you're great. Your collaborator helps you come up with all these wonderful ideas. Your realist or your accountability partner is going to hold you accountable. Well, okay, how are you going to do that? And this is different than a critic. This person isn't there to tell you you can't do something. It's just going to make sure that you're taking the actual steps to move your plans forward. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, it's just a dream. It's not going to be reality. Your cheerleader can tell you you're great and your collaborator can help you with ideas. But now it's time to get down to work. So who is the person that helps keep you accountable to the goals you've set for yourself? And the fourth person I recommend is having someone who's a coach or a mentor to you. And ideally, this person would have a little bit of a been there, done that. So someone who's a little more experienced or who knows maybe the trials and tribulations that you will go through because you'll be seeking advice from them. And I've been asked when I do some of my storytelling workshops, well, can it be the same person? Does it have to be four different people? And it certainly can be the same person. If you have one person in your life who meets all these roles for you, well, that's a really terrific uh, supporting character in your story. But if not, you might want to think through, well, who am I missing? You know, Mm -hmm. do I have a bunch of cheerleaders, but nobody holding me accountable? Do I have someone who's been there, done that before and can guide me through some of my questions? So as you look to, to build your network, don't just think, business-wise, who do I need to get entry to that company or to this next job? Think about who's in your personal cast of supporting characters. Because when you're feeling stuck, these are the four types of people that will help you get out of that situation. And I also remind people to think about what role do you play in someone else's story? Obviously, you're the central character in your own story. But in someone else's story, are you the cheerleader? Are you the collaborator, the realist, or the mentor? What role do you play for someone else? 
because oftentimes our stories are enhanced not just by our own personal experience, but by the way that we can impact someone else's story. Mm -hmm. And like you said, that's just part of expanding your network and, and growing and learning and finding inspiration wherever it may come from. And I know that inspiration is something that we're always seeking as well. So we talk about our third tip here. You suggest that in order to get unstuck, the way to do it is to try new things. What's your recommendation on that for people and how have you used that in the past? Well, one really amazing thing about the times we live in these days is that it's so relatively easy for us to learn about a lot of different things and try a lot of different things. You know, with the advent of the internet, you can teach yourself skills like, you know, I learned podcasting from reading blogs and connecting with other podcasters and asking them questions and looking at YouTube videos about, you know, different uh, audio editing techniques. So there's so many resources that are, you know, many of them are free, you know, or even relatively affordable. So you don't have to be in an actual job to start doing the work. And what I would recommend is that if you want to start getting unstuck, just try different things. So if you want to try doing podcasting, for example, it doesn't have to be an elaborate thing. You know, you can practice. There are very easy applications that all you need is your smartphone and your earbuds with your mic, and you can do really quick podcasts if you want to kind of see what that feels like. You can teach yourself specific software. If, you know, for me, for training, if I wanted to learn instructional design, I could go download a free software from some of the uh, the design companies and play with the trial and teach myself that. And, you know, even if you have a little fun project you want to work on. You can uh, teach yourself coding, how to build a website. Oh, there's tons of opportunities. I guess my point here is to not get stuck where you're just thinking and thinking. I'm like, oh, I don't know if I could do that. Would I like that? I don't know. Just try stuff. And you know, it takes time to dedicate to say, okay, I'm going to try this out. But you know, it's, you'll know from doing it whether you like it or not. And it will definitely inform your decision making. So I recommend not getting stuck in the thought all the time, but actually trying stuff as part of your own career development to see what you like and what you're good at. I love that. And it's such great advice because you can really take it in any direction. And as you mentioned earlier, you started this podcast because you were just curious to see what you could make of it. And you've been dumbfounded at how big it's gotten mm -hmm. and the um, terrific stories you've been able to share. So you never know where you might find inspiration just by trying something. And I think that, you know, you really embrace the idea of being a lifelong learner that you're not only what your resume says you are, that you can continue to challenge yourself and grow and learn new things. And our future chapters are entirely open for us to decide what to do with. You know, our present is very much made up of our past decisions, mm -hmm. but our future is going to be made up of what we do in the present. So in order to, to not get yourself stuck, you should be in this continual state of learning and, and growing. And that's my own advice too, is to make space for creativity. Mm -hmm. Whatever creativity means to you, it doesn't necessarily mean having to live a more creative life, but it means make the space to take the time to think about how and why you do things. Because we're often so busy just keeping up with this hamster wheel that we don't take the time to do that, that we don't make the space to think or even have that open space to consider how we might do things differently and what we might want. So in, in addition to trying new things, make sure that you're not so busy all the time and just plowing forward and trying to get through it that you never actually stop to think about, do I even want to go where I'm headed? I saw an interesting quote the other day. It said something about the wheel keeps spinning, but the hamster is dead. <laughs> <laughs> because we're all trying to keep up, you know, with yeah. this hamster wheel and we're killing ourselves to do it. And hey, if you're perfectly happy with where you are, I'm surprised you're still, you know, listening at this point in the podcast, <laughs> but good for you. That's great. You can stay in that current chapter for as long as you want. Yeah. But if you get to a point where you're feeling a little stuck or not sure what comes next, or if it's even what you want anymore, or you have any conflict or dissatisfaction, know that you can change that up. I mean, stuck is only a temporary state. Mm -hmm. It's not a final destination. And oftentimes when we're feeling stuck, use that as a clue to figure out where you'd like to go next. I love the idea of thinking about our lives as continual and ongoing chapters. The story is not done yet. Right. It really keeps going. And it's the plot points we choose to insert into it that's going to create our future. And what better reason then, if you're feeling stuck, to try something new, make the space for a new creative way of thinking about or doing things 
and be able to advance your plot that way rather than waiting for someone to tell you what comes next or waiting for something to happen. Yeah. I tell a lot of people, the three goal killing words are these three, as soon as. Mm. As soon as I get through this project, I'll take a look at that. As soon as I lose 10 pounds, then I'll do this. As soon as I blah, 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 whatever it is, we're always convincing ourselves that we need to do something first before we can move on. And that's really how you get stuck is you're such a slave to your to-do list that you never take a look at the bigger picture and say, hey, what do I actually want? And where do I want to go? And then once you identify that, then you make the plot points necessary to get there. And you're someone that I admire very much because you've done that in your career and you've taken chances and you've grown your career. And now you have this whole side gig, this hobby on the side, and you're serving a really valuable purpose of giving your listeners stories that can inspire and educate them. And I've just really enjoyed listening to your stories. And I thank you for offering the platform to do it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. It's been a, just a, a wonderful learning experience and I appreciate everyone who comes on the show. And thank you, Valerie, for coming on the show today and uh, letting me be the guest <laughs> and be interviewed today and share my story. I appreciate that. Well, everyone has a story and yours is certainly valuable of time on your very own show. So thank you for having me. It was great to talk with you. Great to talk with you too. And that's our show. Thank you so much for listening. The Beyond Six Seconds podcast is going to be taking some time off for the holidays and the new year, but we will be back in 2019 on January 7th with a brand new episode. And we've got a lot of really great guest interviews lined up for you all throughout the next year. So I hope you have a wonderful holiday season, a happy new year, and we'll see you again in 2019. Thanks for listening to Beyond Six Seconds. Please help us spread the word about this podcast. Share it with a friend. Give us a shout out on your social media or write a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. You can find all of our episodes on our website, www.beyond6seconds.com. Until next time.